Okay, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for speaker series. Um, obviously, there's some technical difficulties. We've been used to everything being on Zoom for the past year. So switching back to real life <laughs> uh, brings up some differences. Um, but thanks so much for coming here. It's awesome to see everybody here in person. Um, we're super excited about this semester. Um, you can see here, we have some really great people um, coming to talk with us this fall. Um, I'd like to take a second just to thank our speaker series team. Um, my name is Julie Coleman and I'm your graduate uh, coordinator. And then I have Sam with me. He's the oncoming graduate coordinator. Um, and we also have Keith Christensen, Deandra Harps, Marianne Anderson, and um, Alyssa Chamberlain on our team. And uh, we really couldn't do this without them. They've been amazing in bringing a bunch of people in and just keeping everything organized and running smoothly. So, um, of course, I forgot to mention Todd Johnson, too. <laughs> Um, he's at the top of the list, but I'm sure you all already know that. Um, and then it's my job to introduce a man that needs no introduction. Um, Keith Christensen is our department head and he's a professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. Um, his interests and work focuses on environmental and social justice issues and he's interested in design and planning that will help to um, overcome barriers that people face when they want to participate. Um, he's very excited to be working with Margot Wheeler. She's our 2021 visiting faculty, and I'm gonna turn it over to him to introduce her. Thank you. Um, and thank you for working with our format. We have a hybrid format today where some of us are here in person and many of us are not. Um, we did that so we could spread out a little bit. So naturally everyone in the room is sitting together. Um, had to kind of laugh at that. Um, well, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Margot Wheeler. Uh, Margot Wheeler joins LEP as the Canyon House Residencies inaugural 2021 a distinguished visiting professor. We are very pleased to have her engaged with our students and faculty this, this semester. She's a remarkable addition to LEP. Um, Margot earned her Bachelor of Arts in Economics from California State University, Los Angeles, and a Master of Urban and Regional Studies from the University of Southern California. During her distinguished career, her first career, um, she served as the Director of Planning Services for several California cities, and it is quite the list. Uh, Palm Springs, San Bernardino, Southgate, Monterey Park, Davis, Palm Springs, and others. Um, from 2001 to 2011, Margo was the Director of Planning and Development for the city of Las Vegas, Nevada, a city of 600,000 residents in 132 square miles. Uh, which was the 28th largest city in the nation. Um, not to mention that it's Los Angeles. Um, I assume she has many stories to tell about her time in uh, Las Vegas. Um, in 2014, she was elected to the American Institute of Certified Planners College of Fellows, which is the highest honor of the profession. This honor is awarded for individual efforts resulting in significant and transformational improvements to the communities uh, served and in the field of planning. Margot is a champion of planning. The very mention of the word planning typically elicits a woo-hoo. Um, Margot's specific areas of interest include downtown revitalization, urban design, professional ethics, and the training and advancement of planners, especially uh, women and minorities. During her career, she has lectured um, uh, during her second career, um, well, during her career, she lectured at California State University, San Bernardino and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And since 2014, the beginning of her second career, she has been a member of the faculty of the Department of Geography, Planning and Recreation at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. 
It is with great pleasure that I welcome Margo Wheeler, the first Canyon House Residency's Distinguished Visiting Professor. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna to talk today about uh, planning and landscape architecture, two fields that are very closely related, but not always in an obvious way. And so my suggestion is that when we see planning and architecture together, we should swipe right. He's already told you everything about me, but I will add to that, that as I tell my students, I am, uh, I am not an academic. I consider myself a practicing planner. And what I tell the students here, I'm most certainly not a landscape architect. I am merely a practicing planner. So because that is my viewpoint, that is where I come from, we're gonna talk a little bit about local government as that is what my experience is in. And where Los La landscape architects come into the picture. I only have the picture up there. Okay, so in local government, you'll have small planning departments, big city planning departments, and consolidated community development departments with different areas of expertise. I have never overseen landscape architects on my staff. They have always been within the public works department. There are many titles that landscape architects have when they work for local government. These are some of those. They usually work within a public works department where you're working on parks, where you're working on streetscapes and plazas and things like this. But let's take a look at how our respective professional organizations view us. These are the definitions of landscape architects pursuant to ASLA and one of the definitions pursuant to APA. And one of the exciting things here is that when you look at the definition of ASLA, you will even see the word planning within that. You will see that design features heavily as does a shared interest in the built environment in buildings, parks, and natural environments. Landscape architecture and planning have common practices. They have common methods. They use scientific methods to come to conclusions and they work with a wealth of professional history towards innovative revolt, results. And one of the things that can never be ignored when it comes to landscape architecture and planning is that neither one ever works in a vacuum. It is noteworthy to address the at common antecedents in our respective fields. We have Ebenezer Howard, Garden City Movement. Let's see, Garden City Movement. If that isn't landscape architecture and planning together, I don't know what is. We have Frederick Law Olmsted and Daniel Burnham, the ones who created the ever famous 1893 White City, Chicago Columbian Exhibition. And Olmsted is considered the founder of landscape architecture as Burnham is the father of urban planning. These two men were partners on many projects in the early era of our professions. We'll throw in Frank Lloyd Wright. After all, he's another utopian that wanted to talk about city planning. Of course, he is an architect, but one of my favorite stories about him is when he was working with Olmsted, he hated giving the, arc, the landscape architecture task over to him because he'd prefer to do it himself. And then, where can we go without Robert Moses? Hmm, the good and the bad, we can't ignore. Central Park, Central Highways, changing the face of American cities. For good and for ill, Robert Moses is also a common antecedent of our professions. We definitely have close, we are definitely close relatives. We come from a common background and a common intellectual culture. This quote is from an American Planning Association press book, which was prepared for citizens as an introduction. I use this text in my class, in my introduction to planning classes. The first chapter is why plan. And this sentence is the concluding sentence of that chapter. This is why we plan. 
As a planner, I know the satisfaction of being part of creating these great places mentioned here. And I think that this sentiment is equally applicable to landscape architects. Okay, that was inspirational. Now let's talk about the real world application. Cities dictate if, where, what, and how to landscape. Mm, I don't know if landscape architects particularly like that, but to get their projects built, almost always, they have to go through a city or a county government so that they can move forward with their plans. The work of these landscape architects is independently created, but has to be collaboratively reviewed by the city planners. This is frequently the case with regard to very specific requirements with regard to planting material, planting location, even irrigation. So now we're gonna talk about some examples of residential design. I have a small note there that ASLA says that residential design is the lar largest market for landscape architects. I'm gonna be now showing you some projects, some programs and some code requirements in specially incentive programs for communities that I have worked for or lived in. We're gonna be looking at desert communities, valley communities and mountain communities. And I'll confess that all of these photos include various homes of mine. That is my home in Las Vegas. And I'm going to talk about a very interesting incentive program that they have there that has been in place for over 20 years. This is a turf removal program where you have the, the staff landscape architects from the water district come to your home, inspect the turf that you have. Then they work with you on a program to replace that turf. You have to have it fully covered. You can't have bare spaces. You can't use concrete, but you can use ground cover, which may include small rocks and um, bark. You may also use uh, artificial grass as long as it is permeable. Your program has to be approved by them. You have a pre-inspection and a post-inspection and you get $3 a square feet foot in rebate when you do that. My house was fully turfed when I moved in. Uh, the roses are original, but that's it. I didn't pay a water bill for a year and a half. It's a marvelous incentive that has worked very, very well. Some neighbors houses in my neighborhood and it still continues to be a very popular program. Another thing that the Las Vegas Valley Water District does is enforcement of irrigation systems. I know this personally because once one of my little, my little spigots was uh, uh, dripping into the street and I got a fine very quickly. I'm thinking they cover a, a, an area of 2 million people, how they found me so quickly, I'm not sure. They also enforce your program when you have the rebate to ensure that you haven't made changes over time. There's a 20 year history in Las Vegas of the requirement to use gray water and golf courses, to turf only the fairway and the greens, and to ensure also that that is enforced. I wanna mention one of the best new conservation efforts in the area of landscaping that is a brand new ordinance in 2021 for Clark County in Las, Las Vegas. It has been adopted just this year where that there may be no ornamental turf, that's no ornamental turf, turf that is not being walked on in any front yards, in any single family homes. You can only have a maximum turf of 50% in the side and rear. For multifamily and commercial, no turf, unless it is in for a plan for a private park on your project. The city also, the city and county also made a change that there's a maximum of 45 acres of turf for 18 holes of golf and only five acres for a driving range. So these are rather stringent and I'm not familiar with any other ordinances that call for the elimination of front yard turf. The city also began a heat island study in 2010 that fully inventoried all of our shade and we continue to work, uh, we, any of my cities, I still say we, we continue to work to fulfill the goals of that heat island study. Now we're, oops, another one in Las Vegas. I always forget that little puppy. That's right across the street from the mayor's house. No, it's next door to the mayor's house. 
uh, this is my home in Palm Springs. I can't say much about Palm Springs conservation effort because it is not nearly as progressive as their politics is. However, they believe in an in, um, and a program to reward those who do good xeriscape and landscaping projects such as this. There's of course no turf here. And they give out awards for green citizens. It's certainly not as, as effective as regulations, but it does give an in incentive to citizens to make improvements on their homes. And I think there's some great ideas for landscaping that come out of the Palm Springs area. Next, we're gonna go to a um, mountain city. This is Flagstaff. Yes, I hate to say it. This is again is my house. Uh, in the regulations for Flagstaff, they have very specific requirements with regard to their trees. Flagstaff is within the world's largest contiguous ponderosa pine forest. All of, uh, those aren't pines, the pines are over there. When I went there, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be in a mountain city where they don't have the same water problems we do have in the desert. But I noticed that there was no turf anywhere also in Flagstaff. I found out later that that's a result of the needles from the ponderosa pines land on all of your areas and so nobody landscapes because the ponderosa pines are essentially your land cut your your ground cover until the next season in the code the zoning code for the city of flagstaff they do something that's very unusual they actually state the goals of zero escape and low impact development lid principles they actually call those out in the code, which is very rarely seen. They require, of course, all of their landscape plans to be by a qualified landscape architect or a licensed contractor. This is the case in most cities, but it's their tree protection plan that I think is most interesting. On any proposal for new development, <clears throat> excuse me, less than five acres, you're required, developers are required to have a 100% survey of forest resources over five acres, I'm, yes, you have to have at least 15% surveyed. Ponderosa pines with a DBH diameter at breast height of 18 inches or more must be retained. You must retain 50% in all residential areas, 30% in commercial and 80% retention of ponderosa pines in single family areas. Any pine you do take down to accommodate your development you must replace it at a ratio of three to one. Again, this is thoroughly enforced throughout the life of your project. Of note, they also have a recent voter approved $10 million bond program for watershed protection. You'll often see Flagstaff has the phenomenon of the fire and then the flood following. So watershed protection, extremely important, full employment for well-trained landscape architects. Our next city is Sacramento, California. This is a much greener city, much more water um, in the uh, Delta area there. And yes, my last confession, that was my house. The Sacramento Municipal Utility District has had a program for free shade trees since 1990. That's the front of the house. You can barely see it. I participated in this program when I first moved into this house 25 years ago. Those trees are all 25 years old. As you can see, I don't think they've been trimmed in 25 years. They allow for, they, if you wish to participate in this program, a community forester comes out to your house. You look at the location of the trees, particularly to shade your windows, your building openings, and units such as air conditioning. The community forester has to approve the location. You may select trees from a list of 40 trees that are approved, and you can have up to 10 trees per lot. That must be the full 10. Sacramento is designated as a sterling level tree city. They are in the top 10 of urban forests in the country. They have an up-to-date survey of the more than 100,000 city trees. And of great interest is there is a full urban forestry section of the city that takes care of these various programs. 
And that has been in effect in their public works department since the 80s. So the city has a full um, urban forestry department and then this free tree program is handled by the municipal utility district. Okay, enough of residential. We're gonna talk a little bit about examples of commercial standards. Um, all of the standard front yard setback and such is important and has to be met of course in all projects. But I think the third bullet is particularly interesting. 30 to 50% of total parking area to be shaded by trees at 15 years of age. This is a great standard. I think every city should have it. Many, many cities do. But as is the case with many regulations, the importance is having the ability to enforce this. So we're now gonna move on to one of my favorite topics, streetscapes. Is there anything better than a tree-lined street? Is there anything that makes a commercial area more successful and more pleasant to be in than walking down a tree-lined streets? When we look at these streets, we often, as urban planners, when we're working on downtown redevelopment and other such related to economic development projects, it often comes up and our city leaders will ask us, well, what kind of pavement should we put in? Should it be concrete? Should it be asphalt? Should it be brick? Should it be cobblestone? Should it be colored? Should it be diagrammatic? And in all of the studies, the visual preference studies that I've seen, there's one answer that always ends up first. People's favorite sidewalk is one that is dappled with the sunlight coming through the trees. That's the kind of sidewalk that everybody wishes to walk down, whether it's residential or commercial. And I think that it, nothing speaks more to that than the fact that it is a common denominator, no matter where you are, what part of the country or what type of climate. Street trees, uh-oh, another one of mine. That's, one, that's my uh, Burbank Street on the right. That's what comes from you when you work in a lot of different cities. Street tree programs. Street tree programs have been around since post-World War II, when new developments would have a street tree out in front of them, one or two. In my neighborhood, when I grew up, we had these wonderful elms, but then they got diseased and they were replaced by crepe myrtles. You've gotta be kidding, but that's what they did. Street trees are important for all the obvious reasons, such as lowering temperature, lessening runoff, um, extending pavement life, but they've also been shown in many studies to slow traffic. There's that feeling of building being within an enclosed envelope of space and it slows traffic. But most important are the studies that have been done to quantify the value of street trees. Most current studies estimate 15 to $25,000 of value per home per street tree. This has been shown in many studies and a recent one by state of California actually showed that street trees was the top benefit that people look for when they look for a house. There's an average 10% to property value with mature trees on your property. Now, when it comes to street trees, it must, we must be clear, let's see if I can do this little red thing, that the tree has to be at the street. I've worked for some cities where developers put a tree in the front yard and call it a street tree. It is not. Let's explore other options. These were the pictures that Keith was trying to get to early. Okay, other public and quasi-public uses where places where planners and landscapers work together. This is SoFi Stadium, the brand new football stadium in Los Angeles. It is an incredible place. Um, these are my pictures when I was out there taking the stadium tutor, tour. It has been described as where design and urban planning are viewed as revolutionary. Everything about this is different for any stadium or any sports facility I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot. The field is actually built 100 feet below grade level. That's why the building is so low. That is in part because of its proximity to LAX, but in part because it's a essentially a savings on air conditioning, correct? When you're building below grade, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, where are you? Um, there is a 2.5 acre plaza, a 6,000 square feet performance area, but what I think is most noteworthy is the 25 acre park that is adjacent to the stadium. 
There's also a five and a half acre lake that handles runoff from the facility. Now this is the centerpiece of what's gonna be essentially a small city that's being built there. There will be 1.5 million of retail and office space. The NFL has already moved their headquarters here. There will be a new hotel and 2,500 multifamily units. On the left is the one of the most incredible features. And when I went on a tour, even the football fans that looked like they'd never heard the word landscape were blown away by these natural canyons. Instead of sitting out on a concrete bench and drinking your beer before the game or at halftime, these beautiful canyons, thoroughly landscaped with native landscaping within a Mediterranean feel, there's four of these around the stadium where people can go and gather in these wonderful gardens that are actually part of the stadium. It's an incredible experience and one that I hope will be replicated often. Public parks is another public or quasi public type of facility that obviously is the realm of landscape architecture and planning. But this one particularly is also interesting because it brings up another area of common interest, which is historic preservation. This is the Lorenzi Park Twin Lakes Park in Las Vegas. I don't think you'd guess it was Las Vegas, but I could be wrong. This was originally a 1926 development with these, the lakes, the pool, a dance pavilion and orchards. It's 80 acres overall. And in 1940, it became one of the famous divorce ranches where people went to live for six weeks to get what was then a quickie divorce. It then expanded to riding, fishing, concerts and events. Right there is a reconstruction of the band shell that is on an island in the lake. At the time, it was the place to go for 4th of July and New Year's Eve celebrations. It's been replaced, of course, but it still fulfills an important function for the neighborhood. This park is only two miles from downtown Las Vegas. In a mature area, where there has, would not have been green otherwise had this not been saved by the city to be, continue to be a heavily utilized park in the area. The lakes are even stocked with fish and there's, fish, there's guys fishing there all the time. Lastly, it is important as it is a migration flyway for Canada geese. I know this because my dogs leashed love chasing the geese there. So an example of mature landscaping, historic preservation, creation of open space, and doing so in an inner city neighborhood. College campuses, my third area of quasi-public or public facilities. This is in Utah. This is SUU. This is the new Shakespeare Festival area. On this slide, we're looking at the landscaping that abuts the old theater leading to the new theater on the left and the area in between. There on the left is the new, the new globe and on the right is the other theater. I thought it was a marvelous example of landscaping. They created a new green show grounds. And here it's important to note on a college campus that you're not meeting city or county plans and regulations, but those set by campus planners and you're working with landscape architects that also work for the campus. So now we're gonna go to two projects that I find very exciting. These are tourism sites celebrating ecological principles. Their ecotourism itself is when you go visit a natural environment. Costa Rica is the one most popularly known where they have formed an entire industry, a worldwide reputation for using their natural ecosystem as a tourist attraction. The two that I'm gonna talk about are essentially utilization of brownfields, well, one certainly, to create an ecological oasis with entertainment and education interest to bring persons in. This is the Las Vegas Springs Preserve. 
It's three miles west of downtown. It's a 180 acre site owned by the water district. This was the site of the original springs, the water coming out of the ground. That was why Las Vegas was founded where it was. The water district had owned this land for a very long time and decided to develop it as a showcase for green buildings and native landscaping. On the map, we have, um, this is all trails, natural trails out here. This is a desert tortoise uh, habitat. That We have museums here and here and here. The museums are both history and environmental science. There is one about the waterworks, one about green building. There is an open air lawn here for, um, it is not real grass, for events. And then here is the real showcase. This is the botanical gardens that have been built here. And all of this uses the water there on the site. Nothing is brought in. In the botanical gardens, we have everything from the Mojave collection, rose herb vegetable gardens, uh, a constructed wetland, and of course, desert landscaping, including Cactus Alley. There's also a wildlife garden, and there's actually a, a tension between the bunnies and the little foxes, and who's gonna have utilization of the wildlife area that day. The desert tortoise area is particularly exciting, and there is a small wildlife area where when, someone, when there is a, a damaged animal, they are kept here until they're well, and so children can go see them. Lastly, a feature that is a direct contribution of the city is here. There's our trails. Uh, again, that's a working water well still on the site. On the left is a butterfly garden where the plants are all to encourage the butterflies and take care of them, which you can walk through during certain hours. And then on the left is what's called Boomtown. <clears throat> At the city, we had downtown some cottages called railroad cottages because they were built at the turn of the last century, 1905, for railroad workers. There were still a few downtown and the historic preservation officer and I thought, golly, we should be able to save those. But the land was too valuable. So we found somebody who moved them for us and they are the reason why Boomtown is there. The four re, re, um, refurbished cottages are there. And then that is a, a replica of the train station and one of the downtown hotels. Kids that go there from that are Vegas as natives, they can't even imagine there was a Vegas before the strip. But this is a marvelous learning experience for, the, for them, combining history with all of the wonderful landscaping that exists on this site. Next is the, the often called the eighth wonder of the world, the Eden Project. This is in Cornwall, England, about 37 miles west of Plymouth, England, which is where I would take students for the summer to work for a month at the city. Their mission is nothing less than to inspire citizenship on spaceship Earth. Tim Smith, who has been knight knighted, is the man who started this with the goal of taking a clay pit right there that had been um, completely used up by the mid 90s. And they started building what would be a Garden of Eden for today's world. They began in 98 and opened to the public in 01. There are two huge biomes, this one and this one, and those have, one is a Mediterranean climate and the other is a rainforest. There are 135,000 plants in each of those, and you have the opportunity to walk through and experience what it is to be in a rainforest or to be in a climate that you have not been in. The purpose, as we saw in the mission statement, is to educate people, to educate people about the importance of plant life on this planet to humans. Why we cannot exist without the 
flora in the world. There are educational placards everywhere. There are persons that are, will interpret and answer your questions, it seemed like every few feet, explaining the use of plants in everyday life. Especially in the tropical one, there's bananas and coffee and everything you might wanna know, talking about the plants that we eat, the plants that we use for clothing, the plants that we use in the making of tools. It's a 100% immersion in environmental knowledge and the threats there too. <clears throat> Excuse me. As part of the education, there are horticultural degrees from the University of Plymouth that you can go and live there and be part of the Eden Project while you study. It's essentially a satellite campus. <clears throat> They're currently building a geothermal plant that will fully heat not only Project Eden, but Cornwall. Cornwall was one of the most economically decimated areas of the UK. And in, <clears throat> at the turn of the century, it was far and away the lowest income area throughout the UK. This project was meant in large part to bring back the Cornish economy. Since it has opened, it has resulted in well over $1 billion to Cornwall. There is a tremendous emphasis on hiring Cornish people. Almost all of, the, all of the unskilled jobs are held by Cornwall people. And you know you're talking to a native when it's really difficult to understand their dialect. <clears throat> the foundation founded by the Eden Project also takes their mission to other countries and continents. They are currently funding the planting of tens of millions of trees in Africa and in South America. Sculpture and art is part of the experience. And this is the Eden Sessions. Uh, the founder made his money as a record producer. And what would be more successful towards bringing young people here Maybe they might not want to come to see the plants, but they're certainly going to come to see their famous, favorite rock stars. The Eden Sessions have been running since 2002. They are extremely profitable and popular and bring in hundreds of thousands of, res of visitors to Cornwall. Lastly, there has been calls ever since Eden has been built to create new Edens. There are brownfields all over this world that would love to become a project such as this. And they're working on three projects right now, one in China, one in the US, and one in New Zealand. For my tourism class, I teach Project Eden and have the students prepare, find a brownfield and then prepare their environmental tourism project for a similar brownfield site. Now, after that high, we're gonna come back to our professions and take a look quickly. Our professional organizations define who we are and you can learn a lot about organizations in a profession by what they value. So what I'd like to do is compare projects that have been given awards by either APA or ASLA or both. And I want you to look at that project and see if you can tell which professional organization has given them a reward. This is rather quick, so you need to pay attention. Whoops. Oh, there's our qualifications. ASLA talks about design, uh, institutions, historic pros, as I mentioned, residential design, urban design, analysis and planning. There's that planning word again, and landmark awards for projects in the past. APA has great neighborhoods, which speaks to architecture, human contact, and nat na natural features. Mm, my husband spelled that wrong. Great public spaces. There's the word landscape, vistas, minimum heat islands. Oh my, it sounds like landscape architecture. And then streets where we have landscaping and design again. Okay, first one, this is Brooklyn Bridge Park. This is in New York. 
This is a beautifully landscaped area, the Brooklyn Bridge. This is Brooklyn, Manhattan's over here. Here's the park looking back at New York. Think in your mind, is that ASLA or APA? It is ASLA, General Design, 2018. Sure looks like an award winner to me. Then we have Michigan Avenue. I don't know, that looks like landscaping again. And it is ASLA Landmark Award 2017, also APA Great Street Award 2008. Fairmount Sugar House area. This is in Salt Lake City. We see the vistas, we see the landscaping, we see the great uh, streetscape there. APA Great Neighborhood 2012. Sundance Square, Fort Worth. Wonderful historic buildings back here all around it. Uh, fountains and tents and temporary gathering places. And then right here, the landscaped area along this edge. ASLA General Design Winner 2019. Smaller project, the Power Station. This is a conference center that was rehabilitated in Dallas, Texas. This is ASLA General Design Winner 2017. Might be familiar to some of you. South Temple, Salt Lake City, APA Great Street 2018. And lastly, Millennium Park, Chicago. What an incredible place. Look at the artwork, look at the areas, look at the landscaping, look at the people. Both ASLA Landmark Award 2020 and APA Great Public Space Award 2015. Now, near the end, I like to put forward ideas that are thought provoking, even controversial. I found this article in the Dirt Magazine, ASLA 2019. And the title jumped out at me. Landscape architects must become planners. Hmm, I thought that sounds like what I'm talking about. In the article, the author speaks to concerns about a history of decoupling policymaking and placemaking. The author Dylan says that landscape architects must scale up, referencing that the level of planning from regional city general plan, area plan, specific plans to project plans show that landscape architects only get involved once we're down to the project plan level. I see this as landscape architectures entering the discussions during the master planning process and earlier in the development proposal phase to then not necessarily become planners, but to become better partners. This article also references mutual leaders such as Ebenezer Howard, Burnham and Olmsted. I thought, hmm, clever guy. But what he says, he says that he sees a future where landscape architect led planning framework becomes the norm. I don't know about that. I say that it's about a partnership. Now remember, we started this talk about planners and landscape architects swipe right. Well, I think climate change has brought us to the point that we need to do more than swipe right and make a commitment to work together at every level. And there's two news articles, very recent, that speak to this and give us the impetus to make this commitment. The Desiree News in August of 2021 was discussing heat island effects in Salt Lake City. They discussed the impact on low income populations of having less capacity to have air conditioning, housing that retains more heat and less shade and relief in the areas they live or work. The article states that urban designers and others can start to take steps to mitigate the effects of heat islands. Well, I think it we're past the part of starting and we'd better get it move on. This article in the Desiree News uses an example of a green roof such as the one that's on the Salt Lake City Public Library. But just yesterday, there was an article in the LA Times that showed us that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, has determined that 2021 has been the hottest meteorological summer on record, hottest ever. Meteorological summer, June through August. Five states 
California, Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, and Utah have had a hotter summer than they ever have had. Nationwide, this summer is tied with the 1936 Dust Bowl. But unlike the 1936 Dust Bowl, this is not an outlier event, but part of a longer trend. We are seeing the loss of human life, immigrant farm workers and the elderly in particular, loss of one billion sea creatures. Sacramento that we looked at that is so green is facing near complete loss of salmon because of the temperature of the river. We've seen 2 million acres of fires and we've seen central California cities with 60 days of 100 or more degrees. And remember that was only through the end of August. There's been an increasing reliance on air conditioning which feeds climate change. So my concluding sta statement is that climate change crisis should mean to us that planning and landscape architecture make a commitment to change the world together. Thank you very much. I await instructions. <laughs> um, do you mind sending me one of the books? Uh, absolutely yeah. not. And do you mind turning it off? Absolutely. Okay. You can share it. Okay, well, thank you so much for such an interesting and kind of relevant talk to this moment. It's really great to see how many examples of planning different cities and its relation to landscape architecture um, that you can bring to us. Uh, so now we're gonna take a minute uh, for Margo to answer some of your questions. Um, we're gonna allow students from Zoom to ask some questions, but I wanted to start first with the people who are here. So do we have any questions? All right. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the process that goes into uh, bringing variables and uh, capturing those variables into the model and then doing the vote on. Yeah, it's a political thing that people got to vote on. So, um, in the case of zoning regulations, uh, professional planners put forth the proposals for the changes in the code for the updates. And then that goes through a public hearing process where the entire community asked, is asked to provide com comment. And then it goes through public hearings and the local city council or board of commissioners of a county is the one that adopts the regulations. thinking, you know, at a national level and, and even global level and states. Um, I'm curious, and, and cities, but I'm curious how you would contrast your planning experience in California and maybe even the various cities that you worked in in California and Las Vegas, given that those political histories and systems at a state level are different. Uh, they are. Um, the, the biggest and most obvious difference is California has the California Environmental Quality Act, which is unlike anything that any other state has enacted in 1970, whereby an environmental impact report has to be prepared on every project over about, about four residential units is about the smallest, that you don't have to do a full environmental assessment of everything, the land, the soil, the air, the traffic, everything that has to do with the project. <laughs> oh my God, two of me, that's just horrific. <laughs> um, so that level of environmental um, assessment is very different. Um, probably Portland has close, theirs is different. But when I first went, to, well, the most obvious different, when I went to um, California, when I first started out, 
to learn California law, California land use laws, like, you know, two bookshelves about six feet wide each. And I went to Nevada and I asked where, you know, where the law book was and they handed me, you know, a little paperback like this. Oh, that's it, huh? So the level of review of new projects is the most significant difference, not only between California and Nevada, but California and other states also. And so the state legislature is crucial in assisting, insisting that cities do that level of review. A city can choose to do a level on their own. For instance, in Palm Springs, there's a tremendous review of hillside development. You have to you know, put up the bars and show how high it's gonna be and you analyze it. Um, in Las Vegas, we required um, every general plan or rezoning, you had to have a community meeting in the community before the public hearings. So there's a variety of things that individual cities can do, but of course, at the state level, it has much more teeth. stories about that level of um, control at the state level in California. In fact, I was in uh, Ashton, Idaho, at an ice cream fount on a really hot day, and I happened to ask a woman, uh, she'd grown up in, in Ashton. And she said, no, I came from California, and I fled that place. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of us that a lot of students and stuff that go home and we go to our friends and we go back up to Idaho and we engage in conversations with our colleagues and our friends and stuff. And we come here and we learn about this stuff. And it's like, uh, and then we hear from you, you know, this level of control and whatnot. And so we're kind of connecting that maybe this is necessary. But now we get into these arguments where it's stereotyped as if it's <laughs> I've heard this for decades, and what always amuses me, and, and again, I've been in, so I was in Arizona for seven years, which definitely isn't California, and I was in Nevada for 10 years, and both of those states love to talk about, oh, well, everybody from California is coming here. Huh. Why is it that you can't buy anything in California? Because there isn't enough housing because everybody wants to live there. And all the jobs are going to Arizona and all the jobs are going to Nevada. I don't know. It strikes me California is just doing fine. Um, I have a sports analogy. When I lived in Sacramento, they'd put up big banners when the basketball was going on and they'd say, beat LA. And I thought, you know, nobody in LA says beat Sacramento. You know? So if you think about it, the people that, you know, nobody in California says, oh my gosh, we're so worried. Everybody's going to Nevada. California is not worried. Nobody's worried in California that all the businesses are going to go to Arizona. You can complain a lot about a lot of things. You can complain about zoning ordinances. Yes, there's a lot of California law that has to do with protecting the environment, but Mightn't a lot of us want to live somewhere where the environment's being protected? I'm going to pick so I'm going to pick something else other than boomers versus millennials. I'm tired of talking about me. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, 
It was about equity serving, serving underserved populations. Wasn't that part of it? Uh, I think it said it was different okay, different demographics. Okay, I'll tell you one that I like a lot that has to do with this topic of planning and, and uh, landscape architecture and parks. In Las Vegas, we were growing um, during the growth years. We were growing tremendously. And it was very easy for the, we needed to improve the amount of parkland per capita, okay? So when we added a new development, you required the developer to build a re real nice spiffy park out where the new development was. And this was great and the council loved it because they felt that the numbers were getting much better. We were getting a lot more parkland per capita. Well, I wasn't happy with that because I'm looking at the inner city neighborhoods that still don't have a park. So I said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the national standards for the, the, the radius for um, regional park should be within X amount of miles of everybody, a community park within this distance, neighborhood park within this distance. And we did that to see our areas that were underserved. And when we found those areas, many of them were in the inner city area. And so I said, I wanna do on these areas that are underserved at these various levels, I wanna look at the demographics. I wanna see what the income level, what the overcrowding is in that area. And mostly I wanna know how long those citizens have been underserved. That neighborhood may be 50 years old. So if I have a neighborhood in the inner city that has been underserved for 50 years to get a park, they should be prioritized over out in the hinterlands where they just haven't gotten a park yet. So we did a full analysis of exactly where parks were necessary. We can't buy the, you can't designate a specific parcel because we can't make that commitment to buy it. But we can say in this area is where a park should be the first priority. And then we had that actually in our policies that were adopted, we said that in order to put a park somewhere where it's not prioritized in the general plan, they have to, the council has to make a general plan amendment to say that they've decided to prioritize a different area. And we really hamstrung their development decisions. And that's one of the things that I'm most proud of. For those of you who didn't catch it in person, the Slido codes are up on the, the walls as you're walking out. So just make sure you get credit for being here in person. Um, and let's give another hand for Margot.